We'd like to welcome everyone tonight to Central Baptist Church in Woodbridge, Virginia. I'm Pastor Brad Winnegar and so happy to welcome all of the folks who are here and those who are viewing tonight. God bless each of you out there and those that will be viewing in the future. It's wonderful to be able to come to you this way by our live stream and our online ministry. Praise God for that. It is a very special evening. It's Wednesday evening, August 25th. It's the last Wednesday night of the month of August. These days have been warm ones. They call them the dog days of summer. I don't know that I would uh, insult the animal kingdom that way. It's been rather warm, but we get some relief and we thank God for every bit of it. And you know what? If you've been complaining about the heat, well, just wait about six months. You'll be complaining about the cold as well. But God is good all the time, isn't he? Can I get an amen? amen? And God has been answering prayers. I heard about some answers to prayer. I preached Sunday morning on the, the elements that are necessary in order, to, in order to get our prayers answered and how we can have great prayers answered. And God has answered some prayers. Of course, there are always those who will be on our prayer list, and we want to pray for them. Tonight, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians, Philippians chapter number three. Two very familiar verses. They appear uh, before us very frequently, and often around New Year's we have this. Uh, Philippians 3, 13 and 14, it says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There are many things that we would like to accomplish in life. I'm sure as we sit and dream and, and think about it, there are lots of uh, positions and lots of uh, achievements that we have in heart and mind. But there's some higher ground that we want to reach for as we press toward the mark. We're going to be talking about this tonight. And uh, I hope that you've got your heart and mind lined up with the Word of God and with God's perfect will. Now let's get our voices lined up and sing out, shall we? Amen. Yeah, please take that Burn the Hymn book out tonight and turn with me to number 246. And I want to ask you to please stand with me as we sing together now. I'm pressing on the upward way, higher ground, amen. Number 246. Let's sing together now. I'm pressing on the upward way. That's a great. 
great hymn with a great message, and it's the Lord that plants our feet. We've got to ask Him, though. We've got to seek Him. We've got to depend upon Him. Let's go to Him now in prayer. Father, we thank You so very much for the truth of this song, and Lord, I pray that we might be seeking higher ground. We might desire to be standing on that higher plane. Lord, we thank You for Your grace. Bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's children said... Amen. Turn around and say hello to somebody tonight. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Once again, welcoming our folks who are coming live stream. A little bit later, we're going to be receiving an offering. We've got just tonight and Sunday's offering in order to give to our special project of placing a pocket-sized Bible in the hands of every member of the Polish military and armed uh, law enforcement. And we want to make sure that they have that. It'll be a great hedge against any, uh, any uh, attempt at raising the Iron Curtain again in the future. We want to reach as many Polish, precious Polish souls for Christ as we possibly can. So I hope that you'll participate. Thank you for your faithful giving. On the way out, be sure to pick up your copy of Days of Praise for the coming three months. Also, Acts and Facts, absolutely free. We're glad that you can have this good reading material. Some folks have asked about my sister's book. Critters in the Hollow, and also about my sister-in-law's book. And these are going to be carried in the bookstore, so you can get those as soon as they arrive. We're working on that order as we speak right now. All right, how many of you are glad tonight that you've got the Word of God? Come on, how many of you are glad that we've got the Bible? The Bible tells us how to get to heaven and how to live until we get there. Those are the two things. Whenever we're talking to people about the Bible, they get kind of uh, glassy-eyed and they say, you know, there's 66 books, man, there are uh, so many, cha over 1,100 chapters, there are so many verses, so many words, so much material, and uh, yet those same people will devour other kinds of literature or perhaps electronic things that come to them, and we believe that there's nothing more important than knowing that we're going to heaven for sure, and then knowing how to live until we get there. Last week in our study in Philippians chapter 3, I'm so glad that we learned uh, about Paul's view toward the religious past. He called that carnal religiosity uh, nothing more than dung, refuse. And he said that he counts it all loss uh, to know Jesus Christ better than and better and better. And that is what we sang about tonight when we sang higher ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. That doesn't mean that we're working our way to heaven. That means that we're gaining spiritual ground. Our life is like a journey. And if we are not progressing, we're falling back or we're stagnating. And we don't want to do either one of those. I don't want to spin my wheels in the same place. I want to make progress. I want to make spiritual advancement. Of all the goals and achievements that you and I might dream of, you know, if you dream of position or power or money, uh, that pales by comparison with our progress in the Christian experience. The writer of the song says, My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. A lot of the people who are afraid right now, they're afraid of their own shadow. They're afraid... They, they call themselves a Christian, but they're afraid of this, they're afraid of that, whatever the next thing on the horizon is. They're just filled with fear. That's what the devil wants because he is the worst possible, most successful, but the worst possible cosmic terrorist. It is his goal to instill terror and fear in your heart. And so if you're afraid of sickness or you're afraid of death, or you're afraid of whatever it might be, the, the devil's got you exactly where he wants you to be. You're not going to be a positive, walking by faith believer. You're not going to be progressing. We need to have that higher ground experience. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. I want to live above the world, the world system. Satan's going to hurl his darts at us, isn't he? We read about that in Ephesians chapter 6, but we put on what? The whole armor of God. And we walk by faith and not by sight. We want to scale the utmost height. So everything in that song is for us tonight. And life is pictured variously as a journey and also as a race. I run the race, Paul has uh, told us, reminded us. 
And everyone who runs, runs as if they're going to win the prize. They run hard. They give it the very best that they possibly can. When I was in high school a long, long time ago, I participated in sports. And uh, I had always been uh, a runner from the time I was very young. And so uh, I got serious about it and made it a discipline. And uh, praise the Lord, I was able to win some honors, set some records. We still hold one record. Uh, after all these years, over 50, 55 years, 55 years, we set the record 56 years ago. It hasn't been broken. And uh, that's a long time for any kind of record to stand. But we worked very hard. We planned. There was a strategy involved in it, and it was a particular kind. of. It was a mixed uh, medley sprint race, uh, for, uh, and, and we passed the baton, and I was part of that foursome that set that record that still stands. But uh, I have a, a few pictures that were taken. I, I, that was, this was before people did selfies and before you had you know, cameras on your phones, and people didn't have phones like that. This was back in the old days, kids. And uh, so there were, there were photographers. They usually had the old with the, with the flash, you know, the big, I'm talking about olden days. And there was, there was a camera and a cameraman waiting at the finish line at one race. And I came through and broke the tape and, and won the race. But the picture, uh, even though I'm breaking the tape, and I don't know if you've seen this picture, I think, and I'm in agony, absolute agony, uh, because I put it all into finishing with everything, leaving nothing on the table, nothing behind whatsoever. Our coaches taught us, you always do your best, but don't. Don't have anything to spare when you finish. When you finish, when you hit that tape, that's, that's where all your energy goes out. You want to absolutely finish uh, all the energy in that, that burst of speed at the end of the race, agonizing to win the race. So we're in the business of running the race, and we ought to try to, to be the winner, and we want to try to give it our all if we possibly can. The Apostle Paul leaves behind... In his past, he leaves behind the carnal religiosity of the past. We're at verse number 10, which is the pivotal verse we left off with last week. All right, we're in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. And he says, here's his goal, that I may know him. He means better and better and better, more intimately. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. That verse uh, helps us to summarize the previous verses, verses 4 through 10, but also introduces verses 10 through 16. Let's look at what's contained in this pivotal verse. That I may know Him. That means we're never satisfied with what we have already learned about the Lord and say, that's it. I know everything I need to know. I've experienced everything I need to experience. No, there are fresh and new experiences in the Lord every single day. I can testify that every day is fresh and new with Jesus. And the power of His resurrection, now that resurrection that's spoken of, we believe in the historic resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that's a fact, that He was dead, totally dead, and He rose from the dead. And He has a resurrected body, and we're going to have a body like that when we rise from the dead also. But the resurrection is not just historic. The resurrection is an experience that we have, resurrection power as we claim it. The power that raised him from the dead is the same power that enables us to rise up out of the ashes of whatever defeat, and difficulties, and challenges that we've been through. It doesn't matter, dear Christian friend, what we go through. There's always resurrection power. It's available to us through Jesus Christ. So he wants to know the Lord more intimately with a fresh and growing experience every day. And he wants the power of the resurrection to rise above whatever defeats, whatever difficulties may lie behind him. And then he says, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Everybody wants to fellowship, but they're always thinking about the fun of fellowship. And fellowship can be enjoyable. But here that's the fellowship is referring to the fellowship of his sufferings. Because we're still in this world and we're still experiencing the persecution that comes, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
I want you to know that every single day we're going to face being put down. We're going to face mockery. We're going to face uh, uh, you know, unbelief and uh, people that will doubt us and will try, try to impugn our character and say things about us. Uh, I was sharing some of that. It, it happens all the time. People will lie about you and, and they'll get away with it because that's what they do. That's where, uh, that's the realm in which the devil operates and those who follow him, the lies. So if, here, here's the thing. After you have worked a lifetime to have a godly reputation and to keep yourself pure and to live, walk by faith and to live right and you finally get elected president of the United States, you can kiss all that goodbye because there will be people who are filled with the devil who will lie about you and will try to stir up stuff and they'll try to say that, uh, that uh, oh, you were elected by money that was provided by the whatever, you know, uh, people, people in Australia. They fund it. And, and, and they, they happen to be the bad, not the good Australians, but the bad Australians, you know, from that other part of Australia, whatever. And they'll, they'll make up lies about you. And they'll lie about you. And when you get, as a Christian, when you get to the top of the heap in business, for example, and you get to be... Uh, on the board of directors or the chairman of the board or whatever, they'll lie about you. They'll try, to, they'll try to impugn your character. They'll say things about you that are not true. Why? Because that is the nature of the enemy. Satan is a liar. He's the father of all lies. And he is going to say wicked, terrible things about every, every Bible-believing independent Baptist that he can make up. So you don't, have to, you don't have to worry. First of all, we're all sinners. We know that there's plenty of sin out there, but they'll... Make up plenty that's not true, and that's it. The sufferings that we have identifying with Jesus Christ includes having our character impugned and having wicked things said about you. You say, now, how do you deal with that? My uncle was, uh, was a, a great defender of the faith. I had uh, five uncles who preached the gospel. My dad, I have a, a cousin, two cousins that preached the gospel, brother, and... Uh, number of others uh, that in the family have preached the gospel and uh, have stood for the faith and yet uh, have had lies told about them. And my, uh, my uncle who preached so faithfully all of his life was greatly hated by the devil and hated by that crowd. And uh, so they would say terrible, wicked things about him. And I said, uh, uncle, what are you going to do about that? Uh, they're, they're killing you. He says, I died a long time ago. That was his answer. I died a long time ago. We have to die. We have to die to our own self and to defending ourselves. Our job is not a 24-7 defense of ourselves. The only time we ever defend anything is when it's the defense of, of the, the faith, the defense of the truth. But we don't have to defend our character, our reputation, or anything about ourselves. We just have to be right. We have to walk in the light as he is in the light. And we have uh, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us. And we have fellowship one with another. Amen. Amen. So the fellowship of his sufferings mean terrible, wicked, horrible things will be said about you. And you'll be put down and you'll be doubted and you'll be treated, mistreated, treated badly. You'll be passed over. Just get used to it. Ah, but that, that day is going to turn. And someday in heaven and glory, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. Someday in the millennium, you'll, you'll be a ruler over many things. You've been faithful over a few. All right, being made conformable unto his death. We just get used to the idea of dying to self. So here, here's what you put down on your to-do list. Stop defending yourself out of pride and, you know, the fact that you feel badly that people are putting you down or saying things about you. Stop it. Just stop it. You don't have to defend yourself. You absolutely don't have to say one word in your own defense. Don't you think God is capable of righting the wrongs and, and turning things around? Absolutely. What you do when people speak ill of you is you say, I'm sorry you said that. It's not true, but I'm going to pray for you. That's it. I'm going to pray for you. I'm sorry you just cussed me out. I'm sorry you just said bad things about me. I'm, I'm so sorry that you did. I'm, I'm going to pray for you. Throw that back at them, all right? So there we are. This is, this is the playbook right here, folks. This is it. This is how to live. This is how to have higher ground. I want to have a higher ground experience. When I walk out of here tonight, I want to walk out of here spiritually a little higher than I walked in. Amen? Amen. All right. If 
by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, once again, there is a, a, a historical, physical resurrection that we believe in. and We absolutely know that because he's been raised from the dead by that power, that one day will be raised as well. We know that according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you read that, that'll give you great uh, faith and assurance and confidence that uh, whether we're alive or whether we have passed on, this old body is going to be raised out of the grave someday. Can't wait for that time. It's going to be wonderful. But also there is a spiritual sense here that needs to be acknowledged. And that is attaining unto the resurrection. That means every day we rise out of the ashes, out of the, out of the, out of the heap, out of the, out of the defeat, out of the dust. We rise up. We rise up by that power every single day. And we just keep rising up. We just keep going. We get up and we go. We get up and we go. We get up and we go. We never quit. Never stop. Just keep going. Just keep going by the power that God provides and giving Him the glory all the time. Now, how can you praise Him? And how can you sing the songs of glory if you're down there in the, in the dirt? Get up out of the dirt. Keep on going by the grace of God. Amen. Uh, attaining under the resurrection. Amen. Not as though I had already attained. I haven't, I haven't finally and ultimately arrived. And none of us has. Either we're already perfect. That means complete. Because every day we're learning something more about this business of being a follower of Jesus Christ and identifying with Him and with His death and His burial and His resurrection and moving onward and upward and onward and upward. We're learning something new, a, a new twist to it, a, a new application of it, a, a, a new... Uh, setting, a, a new uh, re uh, relationship. Something new is going to happen every day. And what keeps this fresh and exciting as a believer is that it's never the same. There's, we're never, never caught in a dull routine. One thing about a believer that's on fire for God, that's filled with the Holy Ghost, you're never going to die from monotony. Now, I feel sorry for that person that's bored to death because their experience isn't fresh and new, but mine is. And so we always have something, somebody new. Some, I mean, even if it's if the devil throws something new at you, remember, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So even if the devil throws a, a new problem at you, it's fresh and new, and God is greater than that. So let's see what God does about that. Amen. Let's give it to God. Let's just get on our face before the Lord and say, Lord, I can't handle this. You know, this is fresh and new. I've never seen this one before. And uh, Lord, dust you off, get you back up. And, and when the old devil throws that thing down the middle, and it's got a new twist to it, you knock it out of the park by the grace of God and for His glory. That's exactly what you, you just keep going. Just keep going. Don't stop. Don't give up. I know it's hard to, to be the Christian that you want to be when the devil's all the time trying to mess up, you know, the thing that you're trying to do. But the thing that we're trying to do, our motive is right, our heart is right, you know, our spirit is right. We're following the Lord, and so we get a little, we get a little soiled. We get a little, we get a little tired, we get a little weary, so what? So what? The perfection that's spoken of here is the perfection of that which the Lord is adding to us. He's given us higher ground. He's adding to our character. He's adding to our completion, to our perfection. We're not perfecting ourselves. He's perfecting us. He's molding and making us after His image and for His glory. As we, as we go through these things, you say, oh, it's all messed up now. No, that's part of God's process of bringing us to where he wants us to be. You say, thank you, Lord, anyway. It wasn't the way I planned it, Lord. I, I hadn't, hadn't planned, you know, you look in the spiritual mirror and you got that dirt on your face. You say, I hadn't planned this, you know. Hadn't planned to be down in that. But, you know, God knows all about it. He knew it before it even happened. All right, so we're, we're not, we haven't attained yet. There's more to go. And we're not already perfect, but here it is. Here's what we're doing on the way to where we're going to be. But I follow after. But I follow after. What did I say about getting your prayers answered? You've got to begin with faith. You've got to get forgiven and, and forgive others, and you've got to keep on moving forward. I follow after. You've got to keep on going. We never stop the forward progress. We keep going, and he provides all the locomotion so that we can do that. All right, I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ 
Jesus. In God's master plan, He wants us to keep moving forward. And the reason we got saved is so that we would progress and for the length of time that God has permitted us since we've been saved until we go home to be with Him. It may be minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades. We don't know what it's going to be, how much time it's going to be, but for that entire time, we keep making this forward progress by the grace of God. Once again, he addresses brethren. We read this as we began tonight. Brethren means from the same spiritual source. And that reminds us that we're in the family of God. We're all part of the same spiritual family. I was talking with some folks who are from another country, another culture this week. And I won't give you all the details. They may come to church one of these days. But from another culture, from, from another country, another, another background entirely. But when I began to speak about Jesus Christ, that resonated with them. And they said, yes, they knew Jesus as Savior. And then I said, well, then we're family. We're family. And they had a big smile on their faces, even though perhaps they have not always been treated that way. When you're out of your element, it's easy for people, especially for the unsaved, but sometimes Christians too, to be very cruel. So I realized they were on their journey. I'm on my journey. We're going the same direction. We're in the same family. So what do you do? You encourage people. You say, well, you can't possibly be on a journey because I'm on a journey. You can't be in the race because I'm in the race. No, there's lots of folks who are different from us who have had different experiences than we have had. And they may be a different age from a different background entirely, but they're on the same journey or in the same race as we are. So what do we do? We encourage them. Brethren, we're in the same family. There it is. We're on the same team. I count not myself to have apprehended. I have not yet arrived. I'm still in the process, you see. But this one thing I do now, this is called focus. When I used to run, when I first began to run, I had, I was told, I had some natural ability, but it was unrefined. It was, it was not trained and disciplined. Uh, for example, when I would start out a race, and I would come, you've seen them fly out of the blocks. You know, the blocks are those things they put their feet in, and they get up on their hands, okay? And I would fly out of the blocks. The first thing I would do, I would take a, ja a jag step. Now, I had gotten that originally. Well, I think it's probably the way I'm put together. But I would just naturally kind of step. Instead of stepping long that way, I kind of step out this way to get a little foothold and push myself off. And you see that a lot among runners who also in the fall play football. Because when they play football, they've been tossed a football, and they hold that football, and then they run like that. They run with their feet apart. Not too many great football players run like perfect track men, but instead they, they run choppy steps because they don't, want, they don't want anybody to be able to grab both ankles at one time. Uh, if some big defensive player wants to tackle you, you know, he's got to take, you got to pick one side or the other. If you're nimble and if you're quick, you can jump over this, you know, but anyway. Um, so anyway, I would do that. I would get down those blocks and I'd get up on my hands ready, sit, pop, like that. And after that bang, the first step I'd take would be right here. Meanwhile, the other guy has got about a foot on me because he stepped out there. So they started working with me. And they, they, they had ropes that I'd have to run under. And, and, you know, and it was real uh, challenging at first. But over time, again, 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 again. Again, you do that 100 times a night, and you learn to put your feet in front of them instead of out to the side. And so that's what I did, and, and I, I began to focus on that. Then something else. I had, to, I had a co-runner uh, that ran with me. In fact, I saw him at uh, my 50th high school reunion, and uh, he... he came on uh, junior and senior years, he would stand right up, and he would, he would sprint like this, like he was standing up. Not me, man. I was like a bulldozer. I was just going like that. But he was very fast. He would, he would have very fast and longer, longer legs and bigger steps. So it was always a challenge to see which one of us would win. 
And uh, at the reunion, you know, he was trying to engage me. Fifty years have passed now. He's trying to engage me in a debate as to which one of us was faster and better. And I said, Mark, you're, you're faster. You're better. You're, you're. They said, you win. You win, Mark. Because I was not going to get out in that parking lot and take him on. Now, he was... He looked fit, and he was well-groomed, but I, I could still take him. But anyway, um, the focus on the start, you've got to start right, but you've got you've to continue right. You've got to have the right form. Hands like that, pumping, elbows pumping, not out like this, but in. Now he's standing up, and he's going like this across his body. Terrible form, but very fast runner. So I had to overcome that. I knew I would need every advantage because my legs were shorter than his. And so the way I beat him was I disciplined myself. I learned to uh, fly out of those blocks with straight steps and fire out and pump my arms straight back, good form, and not come up right away and keep keeping that, that position uh, of leaning forward uh, the whole way. And then it became very important as you get toward the end of the sprint. Now, this is a sprint. In those days, they didn't run the meters. They didn't run the 100 meters, 200 meters, and so forth. We ran yards, so I ran 100 yards, which is shorter than 100 meters, and a, and a 220 yards, which is right around 200 meters because of the difference between yards and meters. And there's a strategy to that. Not much, but there's some strategy to that. When we used to run uh, in, the, in the big meets, sometimes we would start over on the far side of the track, and we would be staggered up the track. And whoever had won, uh, had, had recorded the fastest time in the preliminaries, would get the inside lane, either first or second lane. And then everybody else is up on that curve, and it looks like they're starting ahead of you, but they've got further to go because they're coming around wider. See? So it's always good to, to win the prelim because you're on the inside. And guess what? Out of the side of my uh, peripheral vision, I could see every one of those opponents. Ready? Sit, form perfect, go, pop, you know, just like that. And I'm striding out of there on the 220, and I'm passing the first guy and the second guy and third guy. I'm coming around the corner, got the fourth, got the fifth, got the sixth, and I got them all, eight, and I'm coming on down, and I'm coming on down, and I'm coming on down. And when I hit that tape, i got to go into it like that, I, flying just as fast as I can, hit that tape and, and be a, a yard or two or three ahead of the opponents. And... It's all discipline. It's all focus. Here Paul is saying, this one thing I do, got to stay focused. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I'm talking about every good thing, every bad thing, every you know, thing that you're ambivalent about, every whatever it is, before and behind. Forget that. Stay focused on the race. The race that you and I are running for Jesus Christ is paramount. Everything else. Now, if I'm running around that curve and I've got first, second, third, fourth, fifth, this, I've got them all beat, got the eighth guy beat, coming on around, coming on around, coming around, and all of a sudden I decide to look up in the stands. Guess who's going to get beat? I have seen professional racers look over their shoulder and get past. you got to stay focused. Somebody here tonight, keeps going back to the way something was, good, bad, or indifferent. And that's keeping you from running the race today and tomorrow and the next day that we ought to be running for Jesus Christ. Maybe some of that forgiveness we talked about to get our prayers answered. Uh, maybe it's something somebody did to you. Just forget it. You say, but it's so vivid. You're debating your situation that's holding you back based on the fact that it's vivid to you. But I want you to answer one question. Is the blood of Jesus Christ strong enough to do away with that? Is the blood of Jesus Christ great enough to get that thing in your past and keep it there permanently? Then claim the blood of Jesus Christ and leave it there. Amen. That I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, stretching in, pressing, there it is. I press toward the mark. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible presents God's 
desire for you and me, His best for us as a calling. He, he wants us to be saved. And so he, he calls, He reaches. God does all of that wooing and that drawing by the power of the Holy Spirit, the, by cords of love to draw us to salvation. And then it's not, it's not through. It's not just we got saved to go to heaven, but He's drawing us, He's calling us to give ourselves completely to Him and allow Him to work through us and be Lord of our life. And then He may be speaking to some folks about their vocational service for the Lord, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are imparted. And all of that is a constant wooing and a calling and a drawing because God knows it's so much better for us to yield Him in all these areas, salvation and service and, and uh, the vocational uh, aspect of our life, then it would be for us to try to figure it out on, on our own and do our own thing. That's it. That's it. So he is, he is drawing us and we press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's the culmination. That is the fulfillment of what God has always wanted for you. God has always had a plan for us as a people, but he's had a plan for us as individuals. And he keeps laying that out before us. And generally, as stubborn, willful, you know, rebellious children, we fight it like it's, you know, some bad-tasting medicine. And we need, to, we need to accept, we need to just yield to him and submit to him and press toward the mark because when we hit that tape, when we finish finally running the race that is our life for God, it's going to be worth it all. He's going to say, well done. Let us therefore... As many as be perfect, that means spiritually mature, be thus minded. Let's keep in mind why we're here. We're not here about us. We're here about Him, His will, to please Him, to glorify Him. That's why we're here. That's it. Be thus minded, and if, any have, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. There's a message in that. Let me tell you what it is. Sometimes we are steaming along on the race of life, and we're, we're moving along a pretty good clip, but we've been moving so long at that pace, we're not aware of the presence of the Lord, which we have to. We have to constantly be mindful of His presence with us. We're not just out there running this race alone, but He's with us. He's right along beside us, and He's guiding us, and He's encouraging us, and he's helping us, so he's right there with us. If we get off track at all, we're just, we're making, oh, great time, but we're off track. We're not where we ought to be. We need to constantly be aware of the Lord and his presence. And when that, when, when a red flag goes up and we say, you know, I just, I don't sense the closeness, the, the presence of the Lord like I did before. That's when we need to take stock of where we are and see where we've gotten off track. We need to yield to God and say, all right, Lord, what is it? And he'll say, well, it's in the area of pride or hate or you spoke to someone hastily or, uh, you know, it was some other thing that you did out of the will of God. You just took for granted the will of God. You just went ahead because you're so used to doing that. You spoke out of turn. You did out of turn. You had a bad attitude or whatever it is. We need to confess that, make it right, and keep on going. Don't spend a long time there dealing with it. It doesn't take the Lord any longer than it takes us to come to terms with it. How long does it take the Lord to forgive us and to restore us? As long as it takes us to come to terms with it. So don't take a lot of extra time on that. Say, oh, but I'm so unworthy, and that becomes a game. And the devil wants you to just, you know, kind of pivot and, and spin your wheels and not really keep going, making progress he knows, uh, he knows how, how to sidetrack us. So we, God shall reveal even this unto you. How does he reveal it? We, we stay close to the Lord. We, we identify with him. Remember back up there in verse 10, knowing him more and more and better and better, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Now apply verse 10 down to verse 15. There it is. Draw a line down there. That's how it works. So as we're lined up with the Lord, God reveals to us when we're out of sorts in some, some area. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule 
let us mind the same thing. While it is not our only consideration, it is a consideration. What is that? The unity of the Spirit. Do you remember back in Ephesians when we talked about endeavoring to, to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace? How important is that? In order for us to work side by side in this body, in this living thing, uh, successfully for the Lord and bring the greatest glory to Him, we need to be on the same spiritual page. That doesn't mean everybody has got to be alike. That just means we have got to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to direct us. And we may be working together in a project on a particular part of a project together spiritually for the, for the Lord's glory with somebody that may be from a different background, may have different opinions on you know, what their favorite food, their favorite color, their favorite automobile, even the, in their political persuasion. That's possible too. And so when that happens, we need to do what? We need to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So once we have spiritual maturity, then we need to be careful not to go out and be a solo act. We need to continue to be a cooperative part of the greater work of God. God is using different kinds of people from different kinds of places to accomplish his one main goal. Everybody knows that there's a God. They may deny it. Uh, they may not profess it. They may have been taught some kind of foolishness in school from Darwin to Dawkins, all this idiocy about, you know, rising up out of the ooze and, and evolving and so forth when the opposite is true. We're going down, not up. Uh, people, people may not confess to it, but everybody knows down deep in the crevices of our inner being that we were made by design by somebody. And when we really get serious in our vul vulnerable moments, when there's a death or a loss, we have a desire to know whoever it is that formed us and, uh, and to have some comfort and acceptance and love from that one who designed us. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. Now, you can engage in debates on college campuses or in the various chat rooms or whatever with people, and they will try to sound, oh, so elitist and so intelligent and so Ivy League and and, you know, so, so far advanced about all of this. But it all comes down to this. Either we're a special creation in the image of God with his fingerprints on us, or we're just somebody who happened accidentally. I prefer to believe the former over the latter, thank you very much, because the Bible says so. And that gives man a lot more dignity. All right, so as such, as such, I need to realize that this great God who created me, also created this other guy and this other gal and all these other people. And when they come to know him through Jesus Christ, guess what? We now have Jesus Christ in common. And even though we might not like the same color or the same, may not like the same dessert or the same main course or whatever it may be, we don't do things exactly the same on the job. Uh, we are holding in common, koinonia, this fellowship that we have in Jesus Christ. So focus on what? Focus on Him. Amen. And we need to walk by the same rule. What rule? The rule that Jesus Christ established by the pattern of His life. It's not a list of, like, commandments, but it's Jesus Christ. For to me, to live is Christ. So if that person and that person is saying, for to me to live is Christ, and I'm saying, for to me to live is Christ. And we don't have to have it written out. We've got the Word of God, obviously, in the Holy Spirit, but we understand it's the Spirit of Christ that's guiding us. And it's that Spirit of Christ that gives us that unity and that oneness and that bond of peace that we have in trying to accomplish the work of God. So we're on this run. We're all on this, this race. And we're heading toward the finish line. And Jesus is the finish line. And we're all going to do our best by His grace to accomplish that together and not to detract from the glory that should be His. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Every head bowed, every eye closed. 
No, but You've been viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before he voluntarily gave his life. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And he's alive forevermore. Through the shedding of his blood and through his victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask him to save you? Something like this. Dear God, just pray, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to His Word. If you desire more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.